How many of you had a good week? Oh, hey. All right. All right. Sure doesn't feel like Feb. Feb. Yeah. I just say February. Right? Sounds good. You know what I'm talking about. Amen. I know. But it is so good to see everyone. And uh, Helen, good to see you. The Bible says this is a day the Lord has made. So we should what? That's right. Rejoice and be glad in it. And it's a good day to be alive, to come, to worship the Lord. I just think it's just so amazing that, that 2,000 years ago, maybe a little plus, that they... Jesus first met with his new believers on Sunday morning. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still gathering together in his name to worship him. Amen. And uh, that's what Christians do. And this is the day of the Lord. And so we're glad you're here today. It feels good to take time out, pray for people. Amen. The Lord is so awesome. He's so awesome. I want you to bow your head and uh, <clears throat> just let the Spirit minister right now. And maybe there's somebody that uh, He wants to put on your mind for you to specifically pray for. Um, he knows everyone and all needs. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, there is just no God like you. There is no God besides you. Father, you're the living God. You decided to create a world and create us. Father, we know that sin has tainted bad your world. But Father, we rejoice that one day you're going to make it all new. Sin and sorrow and sickness and death will never, ever, ever be heard of again. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for this new heaven and new earth that you've, you're working on and preparing. Lord, I thank you for that new Jerusalem that's going to come down out of heaven. Lord, we just, that's our hope. But Lord, as we're traveling through this world, help us, Lord, to just keep looking up to you in faith so that we can run this race with endurance. Father, we know there's a lot of obstacles in our way. You know that, Father. But Lord, through you, we can do all things. Lord, I just join together with my brothers and sisters. And Father, here we are, your children at your feet again. And we're just praying together, Father, for these uh, names and needs that have been mentioned this morning. God, you know their cry. You know their situation. God, we just pray that you would minister to them as only you can do. God, we just pray for those Christians out there who just don't have a desire to be with their family. God, they just, maybe maybe so many things have, have come up against them and they just beaten down. Lord, help us to not grow weary in doing well because we know it's not in vain when we serve you. Lord, we just thank you for all the privilege to know you and serve you. And God, there's people now that are just hurting so bad, but Lord, you're the only one that can reach down and minister to their heart. You're the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies. Lord, our heart just aches for those that have had to say goodbye to loved one. God, there's just, it hurts, Father. And you know there's no easy way to do this thing. But Lord, once again, we find consolation in you. We realize that, Lord, how many times that we've been in that valley and, Lord, you've been there and you've carried us and embraced us and loved us. And we just love you for that so much. You're such a personal Savior and we love you so much father we just bless you with these praises and needs in the mighty saving healing name of jesus god's people say amen, amen. what a mighty god we serve has the lord been good to you well i tell you what let's just stand in his honor and think about him today 
and all that he's done for you and sing to him. Don't sing to the monitor or your neighbor. Worship is vertical. Sing unto the Lord. What are we singing here? Oh, what a spirit. Thou art welcome. Everybody. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome.
us, each one of you, I want us to sing an old song. <laughs> I love old songs. And I like to stand on the promises <laughs> of God. Let's sing it.
awesome. Awesome, you all. Here's the Lord. You know, there was two words in that last one there. It just said, I know. You know, you know it when the Lord touches you, don't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. You all thank you for that song. You know, that's what our prayer's been. Lord, touch our little buddy. And uh, just something about Jesus' touch. Hallelujah. That's just awesome. Amen. You know, um, I did not talk to speak with uh, David and Becky on the uh, songs this morning. But, it, it, you know, the Spirit always knows what to do. And uh, the very things, things, things? The very things we've sung about um, is involving our message today, and that's just how the Lord works. Amen? Um, if God's in it, it works, period. Um, I don't care what you do and how, how it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what all you concoct and come up with and try to look religious. If God ain't in it, it don't work. But, and it can be the most simplest, unorthodox, unpolished stuff. God's in it, it works. That's just who He is. And if he's in your life, the Bible says in Philippians 1.6, one of my favorite promises, that to being confident of this very good thing, the good work God started in you, he will complete it. And that's a good promise. Amen. Revelation chapter 22, we're in the very last chapter of the Bible today. And we've been preaching a series on the Holy Spirit. And we haven't even touched the surface, but... Um, I hope that we've preached enough that you have become a little more knowledgeable and acquainted with who the Holy Spirit is. Here we find in Revelation 22, verse number 17, the Bible says, And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come, and let him or her that is thirsty come. And whosoever will, let them take the water of life freely. John responds to that in verse 20. He which testifies these things, speaking of the Lord Jesus, because Jesus says three times in this chapter, Behold, I'm coming. And when I come, it's going to be very, very quick. How about in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye? He says it for the third time, Surely, <laughs> A lot of people misinterpret the word quickly. They say they make fun of God. Oh, that's been 2,000 years. That ain't very quick. No, you don't understand. When he decides time needs to cease and he's going to wrap things up that are in this book, it will be so fast it'll make your head spin. Like a thief in the night. Suddenly, I'm coming. John says, Amen, so be it. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Father, please help us to grasp this truth. Lord, I know I'm just a man and I'm nothing. As you said in your word, it's not he who plants nor he who waters that matters but it's you that gives the increase. So bless your word today, and I trust that it will not return unto you void, but accomplish that for which it is sent in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number 17, there are two things in this verse I want to preach on this morning. One of them is an invocation. The other one is an invitation. An invocation is where you invoke a higher power to come to your aid. 
or to do something. And so here you see, if you look at that verse, the spirit and the bride and whoever hears is invoking with John, invoking the Lord to return and take his people home. That's a longing every Christian has. If you do not have that longing for Christ to return, then either you're not saved or we're saved and we've gotten very lukewarm and too comfortable in this world. Maybe that's what God is doing. As the old mother eagle makes the nest so dreadful to live in, it's like she gets the straw and makes it all just rough and tough. And her little ones are like, Mama, this is so uncomfortable. I'm just going to go fly. That's how she gets them out of the nest. Maybe that's what God is doing, making our world that we've got so cozy in so uncomfortable. So we're just like... Okay, Lord, I'll fly away. Maybe. I don't know. But you know he's coming. We want him to come and return. The second thing in the verse is an invitation. And that is the second longing every Christian has. How do you know you're Christian? Hmm? If I could give you one good little measuring thing today, whether we know if we're Christians, what in the world would it be? Ah, every Christian shares this second longing. They want to see others saved. I mean, come on, if I had the cure to COVID and didn't tell anybody? If I had the cure for cancer and I never shared that? You would say, Bobby, you're so cold. Right. And me and you have the cure for sin, death, hell, and the grave. But how cold must we be to not share that? And so the the Spirit... Now, you know who the Spirit is. It's amazing, isn't it? The very second verse of the beginning of the Bible, the Spirit is there moving, executing, creating. And the same Spirit is at the very end of the Bible, wooing sinners inspiring the bride. Who is the bride? We'll talk about that in a minute. But the bride is the church. But if you ask a lot of people today, who is the church? You get all kinds of things. The church is simply the bride of Jesus who is the bridegroom. And the church is made up of any person that has placed their faith in the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. If you have put faith in Christ, born again of the Spirit, you're in the church. And when Jesus comes, that's the only group of people He's coming back to take with Him. The church... I don't have time, but I want to take off right now. I'd like to because the world looks at the church today as totally irrelevant or in their way. We nag them. Fussy all the time, ain't we? Just trying to stand on the Word of God and live out our convictions and based on things in the world like them old Christians. They're so contrary to culture. So I don't know about you, but I'm proud to be in the church. My wife and I, God called us to minister to the church. It's our family. And so I don't care how frail, how weak, whatever the world thinks of us. Listen, I'm staying with you guys. You're my family. And when Jesus comes, I don't want to be left behind. He's coming to get the church. I want to be right in the middle of her. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the spirit and the bride. Now, look at your verse. This is important. Now, when he says bride, he's talking corporately, collectively, all of us. All of us. We're here today. And we, we, we're here today to sing and worship and say, Lord, please come back. We're here today, hopefully, to get inspired to go out into the highways and hedges and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So corporately together. But notice the next line in this verse. Let him that hears. Why would the Lord single out individuals because of this? Now, and I don't mean, I'm not saying this to be offensive. I'm saying just because it's Bible. Not everybody that has their name on a church roll is a Christian. That's just facts. Many will, many will stand at the throne and say, Jesus, we did all these things in, in your name. And he'll say, leave me. I didn't never knew, know you. We never had a relationship. Yeah, you did all that religious stuff, but we never had a relationship. We were never in love. I was never the bridegroom and your bride. You never loved me. You did all those things for other purposes, but you never did them because you loved me. Jesus said, I don't know you. Love is an intimate thing. But he who hears is, are you a Christian? Are you a part of New Life Church? And telling us, we're telling each other we're Christians. But there are people in the church who do not hear the Spirit. Do you hear me? But those who walk in the Spirit and are led by the Spirit seven times in Revelation 2 through 3. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. If you and me are walking in the Spirit, then we're hearing Him. And what is He saying to us? He's saying something through us and the Spirit says, Come. Come to Christ. You know, while it's on my mind... I'd like to challenge you with something. I'm going to just take a little salah moment, a little pause. I'd like to challenge you to do something. And you don't have to do it because I'm challenging you. But think about it. Would you think about it? If you're a bashful person, very shy, even though you're a Christian, and even though you have a testimony, you have a place, you have a whatever, a time where the Lord saved you, you have a testimony. And maybe you're shy and you never want to talk about it. Would you do me a favor? Would you write it down on a piece of paper and put it in an envelope and give it to some of your family? So we'll know at your last day that you were a Christian. Can I take that challenge a little further? They, we sang a song this morning. I love to tell the story. And in that song was a line some have never heard in America. If you're a grandparent, if you were my grandmother, grandfather, and I was uh, living my crazy life, not thinking about spiritual things, it would be a shock to me, but an eternal blessed shock. If you said, Bobby, you get time, I need you to stop by the house. Maybe you're a parent or grandparent and just take 10 minutes and say, I would just like to share with you when Jesus saved me. Did you know there are kids whose mamas and daddies, they've never heard their testimony? Just nobody has the influence you have. And you know, you may, you may say, my son's rowdy, my daughter's rowdy. Have, have you sat on it and say, listen, I just have to tell you this. Okay, that's free. That, that wasn't me. That just is a good challenge. Amen. Amen. It's funny you brought that up because I've actually got to wrote down a piece of paper in my wallet. <laughs> oh, Robert's ahead of schedule. The Lord's working on you, brother. 
Oh, but you shouldn't have said that because I'm going to get you in a little bit. But you are right on the money, brother. I love that. Now, let's just take a second and do the invocation. I know you're busy. You're caught up on life. Things are going so fast. You got plans and you got things. And, and I know we're not thinking about Jesus coming back. I mean, every now and then we throw on the TV, look like all this war and this crazy stuff, all the world's a mess, and, and we'll throw it out there. You know, it's got to be the end of time. We never say, Jesus is coming. We always say, it's the end of time. You know, things are wrapping up. Okay? So, true Christians that, that are walking in the Spirit long for the second coming of Jesus Christ. If I'm lost, the last thing I want is for Jesus to return. Whoo, boy, that puts chills down my spine. Now, now I want to throw some scriptures out here that, that are on my mind and heart. I, I told Chaz, I said, just he's getting really good at it. He's, he's becoming a super typist, I guess. He's, in John chapter 14... Probably some of the most famous verses in the Word of God. I mean, as far as blessing families in a funeral service. Because they're so full of hope. But I, there's something about these verses I want you to understand. There, there it is. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said, I know you believe in God, so believe in me. In my Father's house. Some of you know these by heart. I, aren't you glad? He didn't even say heaven. I love how he said it. In daddy's place. My father's house are many mansions. I like that word. You know, some preachers don't like that word. Oh, that's old King James stuff. It's many rooms and dwelling places. I like mansions. Amen. Maybe he'll give them preachers a trailer. On wheels. I don't know, you know, but I like that word mansions. You know, some of us have never had a mansion, and it's good to know we got one. So I like mansions. In my father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. Now, look what Jesus says I'm gone to what? Get a place ready. And then he says, When it's ready, I'm going to come back, I'm going to receive you. Did you know in a Jew remember now we're talking about the bride in a Jewish wedding the young man would come with his daddy with gifts now I'm not going to go through the whole scenario but just the essence of it he would come to this young lady and he would ask her to marry him and they would go through these rituals of exchanging cups and if she agreed and said yes then this young man would look at her and say to his bride-to-be, I'm going to go away for a while. I mean, she's all ramped up with enthusiasm and excitement now, and, and, but he'd say, Father and I are going to go away, and I'm going to build us a house. And the Jewish boy would go, and he would get that house built, and he would get that little place ready, and all the while she's like, is he coming? Is he coming? He didn't tell me when he was coming. Is he coming? Every day she'd look out her window. He's coming. He didn't show up. And don't you know, I mean, you were like, maybe he ain't coming. I don't know. That's what we do sometimes. And so anyhow, here's what he would do. He would plan this way like midnight. And he would sneak in, you know, maybe throw a rock at her window. He would sneak in. But out here on the edge of a town, he'd have his band. Okay, his band. They were quiet. It was midnight, and like a thief in the night, he would sneak in, and he'd get it. He would get this, this precious lady, and he would take her out. And once they got to the edge, the band would crank up like hallelujahs, and did I mean everything, orange, you name it. And they would rustle off with just a great excitement. And so that's what Jesus has done. He come to this earth. We're engaged to Him. He asked us one time in our life if we would marry Him, if we would say yes to Him, if we would commit to Him. And many of us said yes. 
Well, he's going to prepare a place for us, as he said in John 14. And just like this world is hustling, bustling, but I'm telling you, he's going to sneak in. He's going to, in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, the, the dead in Christ will rise. And those of us that are alive and remain at that time, and, and just so quickly, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I'm not going to go into stuff of what this old world's going to do. All I know is there was a guy named Enoch walking with God, and God took him. And the Bible says they look for him. Boy, I don't have time, but just to preach on that thought is eerie. Eerie to be here. We're gone. See, Jesus is coming. The Bible says, do you all remember that classic Ephesians 5? about where a husband's to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave him, there it is, husbands love your wives as Christ loved who? His bride. And he gave himself for it. But notice what he's going to do according to these scriptures. He's going to sanctify her. Come on now, y'all. You know how this lady gets dressed in white in the train and all the stuff. And she's gorgeous. And she comes down out of the And the man, our hearts just fall. We're like, whoa. You know? Old Vance Havner used to say when Adam first saw Eve coming to him, he said, ha diggity. That's what Vance Havner would say. <laughs> God's going to get the church ready, sanctify her, wash it by the, the, the water of his word. And then next what he's going to do is beautiful. He's going to present the church. Now I'm going to tell you something. Right now, we might not look very presentable. I'm not talking about how we dress. I'm talking about the body of Christ. We just seem to be not ready. Y'all know what I'm saying. You feel it. But when the, see, see, when we're, when we're raptured and resurrected, we're changed. This mortal puts on immortality. This corruptible puts on incorruption. And we are now in a glorified state and we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And there, what a beautiful day Jesus presents us in heaven. And then I want you to go to Revelation 19. I want to read those from my Bible since it's just a couple of chapters over. I'm just trying to get you introduced to the bride in which you are. You may not see yourself that way. Revelation 19, 7. So right now, this very moment, 2022, we're engaged. But the wedding day is coming. Here it is in Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Jesus for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Remember, it's come. The Spirit and the bride say, Lord, come. He who hears says, come. John said, come, Lord. Here he is. The marriage is ready. And his wife has made herself ready. It was granted to her. She didn't earn it. It was God's gift that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. This is the righteousness of the saints. John said, right. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you blessed? Huh? When the saints go marching in, are you in that number? I mean, when the trumpet sounds, the only people that are going to hear it are Christians. He's going to call us. Good night. That's bigger than my little brain can contain. But my spirit has no limits. So I soak it up. Let me tell you, when you think you're having a bad day, Jesus might come 30 minutes later. I'm serious. You know, you hear today, it's imminent, it's imminent. Russia's going to take over, it's imminent. You hear that word imminent? That means it can happen any time. And so the coming of the Lord is imminent. And my, I'll throw this in there just for a little, you know, appetizer. God has already said in His Word that He's not going to let man destroy the world. He's going to come back. He's going to destroy it Himself. And so if we're that close to nuclear stuff, 
that we're that closer to Jesus. Do you love Him, church? Could we not all love Him better and more? He's coming. Ready or not, Jesus is coming. And listen to me before I finish with the second half. Write down all your worries. Write down all your sorrows. Write down all your griefs. Write it all down. When that day comes, there'll be no more. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. Jesus saved me when I was 14 years old. I love the Lord, and I'm like you. I could love Him a lot better and a lot more. And I'm ready to go, but there is something inside of me that just says, Lord, I'm tired. Come back. But then there's something in me that says, no. Because I know too many people that ain't ready. And the Spirit knows that. And the Spirit will not only inspire us to long for the coming of the Lord, but the Spirit, His passion. Come on, I get this. Come on. The passion, I mean fire and passion of the Holy Spirit is to seek out the lost. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before Jesus left the, the world, before Acts 1, 8, Jesus had already said, He had already got His little church together and He looked at them and He said, listen, listen, He said, I come into this world not to condemn it, but save it. And Jesus said, everywhere I went, I was telling the gospel, telling the good news, the King has come, He's here, be ready, get ready. Jesus preached, He was a preacher. And everywhere he went, he talked about the good news, I've come to save you. And when Jesus left, he told his little group, he said, listen, you got to keep telling the story. Go into all the world. When you go to the grocery, when you go pump gas, wherever you go, as you're going, wherever you go in this world, share the gospel and be the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's still the power of God and the salvation. And Jesus said, I need some people who will keep telling it. And they said, Lord, but we, they're going to hate us if we tell it. They crucified you. We're going to have family that's not going to want to hear it. We're going to go all through these things. Lord, if we could just be quiet, everybody, we'd get along with everybody. Nobody would be upset. But if we start telling it, Lord, we might get crucified and all this. And Jesus said, that's okay. You might be backward and timid and bashful. But here's what's going to happen in Acts 1.8. Jesus said, the Spirit is going to come upon you. And when he does, he will enable you with great power to be what? Witnesses unto me. The Spirit will make you bold as a lion. The Spirit won't make you rude. But he'll make you bold as a lion. He'll give you the courage to open up your mouth and share the good news of Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Bobby, I might confuse them. That's a devil's lie. If you can just mention the wonderful name of Jesus, God will anoint that. Tell the story. Do you remember in the Bible there were two parables almost alike? I want to use the second one. In the, sec in the first one, he gave people talents, different ones. But in the second parable, the Bible says that Jesus gave everybody 10 pounds. And he gave Carolyn 10 pounds and Tony 10 pounds and Larry. And he said, I'm giving you all the same and I want you to go invest it. I'm going to a far country and I'm going to come back and when I want to see when I come back, did you invest and have something to show me? And y'all know the parable, don't you? This guy went out, he invested. This guy went out and he invested. And the guy came back, the last guy came back. He said, Lord, he said, um, he said um, I took what you gave me and I wrapped it in my napkin. And I kept it safe. 
because I know you're a, you're a hard taskmaster and I didn't want to upset you. I didn't want you to be mad at me and I hit it right here and Lord, I got it. Right here. And he said, shame on you. I come back and all I got is this. I gave you $10 and all I got is $10. And the other guy stepped up and he invested. And the other guy invested. And the, he was very proud of these men because they took and they invested. What's the moral of the parable? The moral of the parable is everybody in here that says they're a Christian has been given a wonderful personal testimony. And the only investment we can make that is eternal is in other people. How many people have you told about Jesus? Do you know of one person that's come to Christ because of your testimony? I mean, you should be able to start with your kids. And there's going to be people you don't even know. You're going to rejoice in heaven. You didn't know you influenced them, but you weren't ashamed of your testimony. Do you know the greatest weapon in the church in the New Testament and now is our personal testimony? There are people that I could preach to for 20 years and never win to Jesus. You could testify to them once. Because they look to you. They look up to you. They know you. They've watched you. They've listened to you. Now sit them down and let them hear your personal testimony. I mean, it'd be just sweet to me if you want to stand up in church sometime and give it. That'd be sweet. Jesus died for you publicly. Tell it publicly. Look at this invitation. Look at it here in verse 17. I want to close. It's so good. It's so, it's so, this is just like, you know what, brothers and sisters, before we close, isn't it like our Heavenly Father to close out His Bible with just a big old invite? Huh? Isn't that just like Him? Isn't He just glorious? That... God has just stretched out His arms and for thousands of years He's invited people to come. You know, the door of the ark. Nobody wanted in. God is such a gentleman. You know what? I want to tell you something. There has been nothing, and I don't want to say embarrassing because I, I'm not embarrassed to do it. But for almost 40 years, I've stood in front of people and invited them to Christ. That's why it's all facing this way. That's why I don't come back there, pull you up out of the chair, and drag you to the altar. Because God don't do it that way. God is such a gentleman. And here, you, you want to know, you think God's hard to get along with. God says, come to me, come to my son, and I will give you so much and bless you so much. I'll pour it in, press it down, run it over. You ain't going to be able to explain. But if you don't want it, but you want to go to hell, I'll let you go to hell. Because he's a gentleman. And nobody in this room can ever say God has not done everything God can do. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, the supper's ready. The marriage supper. The supper. I mean, he's, he has done it all. He did all the work. All we got to do is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. So here's this. Let's close out with this promise. Here's your tool, brothers and sisters. Here's what we are saying and inviting people. The prerequisite in this verse is, really, are you ready? Are you ready? All you have to be to get saved is this, thirsty. People say, I don't understand the Bible. What? You ever been thirsty? You see, God's not using 
scholarly words that are so above our head. God said all you have to do to be saved is first of all, you got to want to be saved. It's scary to have a need and not sense it. It's frightening for people to be unsaved and not feel the need to be saved. But you see, that's the beauty, brothers and sisters. Come on, stay with me now. I'm educating all of us. It's like the, the blind leading the blind, but when God leads us now, the lights are turned on. Amen? You said, but you have all the, we have all these excuses not to share our faith, but we forget the Spirit can do stuff that you can't see. I mean, sometimes, you know, the greatest blessings I've ever had in seeing people saved was when I felt like I made a mess out of the sermon. Because God's just showing us it ain't us. Is there a shortage in labor today? Am I right? If any of you work public work, you should know it is horrible to try to get people hired today. I did share something with this church to pray for me last week, and my boss and I had lunch, and he was like, whatever you need to do. But I feel his pressure because it's just hard to get people to work. There's a shortage in the church. The harvest is ready. The labors are few. God needs workers. God needs witnesses. Brother Bobby, God can save them without us. Sure he can, but he's not many times. Because he wants you involved in his passion. The prerequisite is just to be thirsty. And here's my favorite word in the Bible. If you ever know Brother Bobby passes away, you'll know my favorite word in the Bible. Here it is. I know it's hard to top Jesus. That's just like so. But this is my f favorite basic word in the Bible. Who does God want to save? Rich people? Whosoever. That's my favorite word in the Bible. You know why it's my favorite word? Because it doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. It doesn't matter if, how many fancy clothes you have or don't have. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how bad a sinner you've been. God's very gutsy. I'll take anybody. <laughs> Oh, Lord, you don't want him. He's bad. You remember when the Lord went to that little fella named man and I, he's just a good old quiet Christian working in his little business, wasn't bothering nobody, just doing his thing. And the Lord knocked on his door and the spirit said, Ananias, I got a fella that I just knocked off of a horse and put him, his eyes out and I want you to go witness to him. And Ananias is like, all right, Lord, who is he? Well, it's his name's Saul. He's the guy, you know, been running around killing Christians and ever. And Ananias, he did in the word, Ananias, you can read. He was like, Lord, you know, would you send Brother Bill? <laughs> you know, I heard about him, Lord. We, we've heard about him. And God said, Ananias, I can save anybody. <laughs> Aren't you glad the church ain't a club? You have to have certain credentials to get in. God just says, hey, he just says this, come just like you are. Hey, if you're here today and you're lost, put your name right there. Put your name there. I'm glad God didn't say Whoever's thirsty, let him come. And if Bobby will, I'm so glad he didn't put Bobby there because I've Googled my name and it's out there everywhere. He, I, I probably thought it meant another Bobby in another state. But he left it wide open. You know what's hurt the church? Can I just talk before I finish? That didn't make sense, did it? 
You know what's killed the church? Is our attitudes. I mean, if I was a lost person, I wouldn't go to the average church. Especially if I was a bad one. I wouldn't go. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Some of us, we, we got too religious and we got too up to the. Come on now, I ain't got no amens in my meddling. Huh? Amen. You know, I read something one time. Thank you, Jessica, you sweetheart. Yeah. Uh, I read this. It was a true story. But this guy was so broke. Broke financially, emotionally, spiritually. Just broke. And he looked it. I mean, he looked like your average, you know, like, uh. But he went to a church. He walked into a church. He peeked in the door first, and everybody was looking this way, so he snuck in the back. And y'all know how it is when you're new in a church. It just took one person to look at him, and all heads went. And then when that scraggly guy come in, they said, a deacon with a cane, an old deacon, the king, who had a high position in the church and had respect, slowly made his way back to the old man, and everybody's like, oh, no, what's, what's uh, going to happen? And he sat down beside him to be his buddy. I wonder if sinners, you know, Jesus, do we know him? How do, Tony, why did sinners feel comfortable around Jesus? He was a friend of sinners. He was a friend. Do you, are you all hearing me? He didn't do what they did. But they felt comfort. Oh, my goodness. The sinless Son of God and lost people felt comfortable with Him. You know why? Because He didn't come to condemn. He come to save. He didn't come to hate. He come to love. We need to be more like Him. If we're going to be a witness for Jesus, we have to be like Him. I mean, if you're a lawyer, you want the best witness you can find to win your case and back it up. And if we're going to win people to the Lord, if we're going to influence people to come to our Jesus, we have to be like Jesus. And I know that's hard sometimes because, listen, here's the bottom line. As I said, Jesus did not do what they did to win them. It's a lot of preachers are falling in that trap. I'm not going to get into that, but a lot of churches are falling into the trap. They want to look like the world to win the world. Jesus never did that. And it never works. Because even lost, come on, listen, even lost people expect us not to be like them. They don't want us high and mighty and arrogant, but they know there needs to be something different. Am I, am I, are y'all with me? Let's close with a couple of more thoughts. I love this little promise. The prerequisite is to be thirsty. The persons involved is just whosoever will. And then here comes the really, really difficult, deep, Word that I just don't know if I'm able to explain, but the plainness of the promise, here you go. God handed to this world His Son. Whosoever is thirsty, let him what? What? Take. That is so simple. So plain. Just accept His offer. Yes, you have to do it by faith. You can't see the Lord, but that's the beauty of faith. Is Look, He touched me. God, you can't see it, but right now, this very minute, God has His arms stretched down to earth right now. And He's just waiting for another little hand to reach up and take him by the hand in faith. He's so beautiful. 
And what he's offering, what would happen to this world if you discovered a fountain, a spring on your property that when people drank that water, they would be healed. People would say, there's living water down on Bob's farm. Bob, you would have, oh my goodness, I know you'd, you'd, you'd start charging. But then I know you, Bob. You'd say, have at it, get you a drink. God is giving living water. That's what he said to the woman at the well. Ma'am, I'll give you something that you won't get thirsty again. It'll spring up in you like a fountain in a well. God has given away living water. Why does this world choose death on everything? You know, I sort of think of the angel at the tomb at the resurrection when the angel came and, and he asked this, this, this question to the people who were coming and it was like there was irony in it and almost humor in it. Almost a little tinge of sarcasm and the angel said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? <laughs> why are you looking for living things in dead places? You think that place you're, and I'm not, I'm going to be nice this morning and not go all over the map, but there's places that don't give nothing but death. And it's like the Lord said, why are you seeking life in these dead places? And God has living water. And guess what? Here's the icing on the cake. What's the last word? <laughs> yeah. Just like God, Sister Brenda, to be a gentleman, to give living water, and not charge you a penny. Not charge you nothing. It's without price. The prize of living water is, is free without price. But Brother Bobby, I have worked all my life. My, we were hard workers and I want to do something for it. I want to work. What do I need to do? How do I need to earn it? No, you don't understand. It's free. You just take it. Brothers and sisters, take it and go tell it. Tell somebody. Write a letter, send a text, drop an email. Somebody needs to hear what you have. They need your testimony. I look around in this building this morning. You know what I see? I see people who somebody, somebody was an influence in your life for Christ. Am I right? Somebody influenced you. But I'm going to tell you something. Out there in this lonely, dark, dreadful world, and Jesus is about to come, and thousands and thousands. Did you know they tell me, and I don't know how they even get these statistics, but it's been around for decades. They tell me 60% of Barron County is lost or unchurched. 60% is lost or unchurched. And here's, here's another sad reality. We used to think in third world countries they had never heard the gospel. And now in America, there are literally teenagers who've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. So be open to the Spirit. Let Him lead you. Robert. Let him lead you to pull that out of your wallet and share it. Amen, church. Father, you've really spoke to my heart today. That I need to be a soul winner for Jesus. God, please help me to win one soul. 
Father, I know we can't save anybody, but you said in your word in Proverbs, he that winneth souls is wise. Lord, I read in your word, you made your men to be fishers of men. Lord, teach me how to fish. Teach me how to cast the gospel into the sea of this world of sinners. Teach me, Lord, the patience to wait for a bite. Give me the strength, Lord, and my brothers and sisters to know, as someone said it well, Lord, that we're not to be just the keepers of the aquarium, but fishers of men. Remind us all, Father, that what we have is precious and it has healing and life. Thank you, Lord, for this word today. Please help that unsaved person. Holy Spirit, just like you helped us, all of us that are here today who were lost one time, and we were so, so, so afraid to step out of that pew. We were afraid, Lord. There was all kinds of fears, and we just kept resisting, and we kept holding back. The devil would tell us we couldn't live it. The devil would tell us we'll fail. The devil would just lie to us. People would see us. But Holy Spirit, we love you. You came and you helped us make it to Jesus. So we're praying you would help the unsaved today to just reach out a hand of faith and say yes to you, Lord. This could be the day of their engagement. This could be the day of everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. So be it.